We trust in Jesus. He was and always will be the author. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, again, just good to see you all. A couple quick things before we dive into today's message. Uh, we are actually going to start today 21 days of prayer and fasting. We're supposed to kick that off on Monday. And honestly, uh, doing my very first funeral on Wednesday, I was like, you know what? This is just not working out this week. So we're resetting and starting over today. So if you're like, you know what? I didn't really think about it too much or I, I forgot to hop in. You can start today. If you started early, you get bonus points in heaven for doing more than a 21 day. Uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Or you can, uh, yeah, do your own 21 days. But we do have these great prayer journals that uh, converge, which is the movement of churches we're a part of. They will provide these, and so we get them really, really cheap. Uh, it's just a couple dollars, two or three dollars, I think, I order like a box of 50 of them. So we got a bunch of them out there. Again, we just want to provide you with resources uh, to help you connect with God, to help you connect with others. And this is a 21-day journal where it, it really won't take you too much time. You just read, and then you can journal your prayers, you can journal your thoughts. It's a great tool just for the next 21 days. And then, again, uh, we're encouraging everyone, hopefully, to have uh, one of these scripture journals. We have some more back there. I know I, I've delivered a bunch to people online. If I haven't hit you yet, send me a text, shoot me an email, and I will drop one off at your house. Um, I thought I got most people, but if I, if I missed you, sorry. Um, or if you haven't grabbed one yet, grab one of these. And we're encouraging you, if possible, hey, bring these on Sunday mornings. You know, um, you know do uh, some scripture journaling throughout the week. Um, so like, like this week I was reading, journaling. I was like, I'm going to try my hand to draw on a sheep because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Just any other thoughts you might have. Or, or when you're listening to the messages, you can write down some of these thoughts. And we just, as a community, going through the story of Jesus. And, and what I love about these scripture journals, too, is it's, it's a reminder that like this was its own kind of letter, its own biography, uh, separate. You know, like all, the 66 books of the Bible are all kind of unique pieces of literature that God used to put together all these unique voices, one message, uh, the message that God created us to have a relationship with him. So love to have you grab one of these. And today, if you're here, you can be taking notes. Um, but today we're going to dive into uh, John chapter 2. Last week we covered John chapter 1. One of the advantages of being a pastor is that I get a front row seat to uh, weddings, which means oftentimes I'll see kind of uh, those things that are hidden to other people. You know, like the nervous little fidgeting of hands. Sometimes even, you know, the bride and groom can barely handle the, the, the rings because they're, they're so nervous. And even better, I'm just a few inches away from what uh, scriptures teach is the sacred transaction of, of, of a of a man and a woman coming together in union before God. It, it's a privilege to be involved in weddings. And often I think from the time we're, we're little kids, we see these weddings as these big events and they have all this importance. And maybe as a little kid, the first time you ever dressed up was, you know, to go to some wedding. I remember as a little kid going to my first wedding, I had to wear some kind of dress pants. I don't know, I was probably like Andrew's age or something and like little white shirt and tie. But I would not give up on my twins baseball cap. So I wore that twins baseball cap with my shirt and tie as like a five, a six year old. Uh, you know, but so often that we're, we're trained, these are these, these big occasions and oftentimes, even when, you know, someone gets married, this is the very first formal event that they're a part of. And, and what happens then is that people can get so nervous. They're kind of just brimming with all this nervous energy, and there's this, uh, this potential for confusion. And perhaps maybe those of us who are married, you remember your wedding day. And, you know, all the gamut of emotions that you were feeling on that day, nervous, excited, sweating, maybe just, you know, so joyful, so happy. And as we turn today in, in our Bibles to John chapter 2, we're going to read about a wedding. And those same emotions, those who are married felt, uh, I want us to know that those same emotions can carry over to this little wedding in Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2. And in, in this culture, in first century uh, Palestine, first century Israel under the Roman Empire, 
uh, the, the wedding celebration was considered the most grand event in anyone's life. Oftentimes, it was kind of the one and only chance that you had to be the center of attention. Sometimes, even in, in Jewish weddings, like the bride and groom would have crowns for a week, and they'd get to kind of issue orders, and, and it was all about them. And this is this one time maybe they're getting their whole family together to feast, and they don't have to work. And, you know, in, in, in a culture where most people were living kind of quote-unquote, paycheck to paycheck, you know, not sure where they're going to get their next meal from, you, you know, uh, not very wealthy. There really was no middle class back then. This was kind of a bright spot in their kind of dreary, everyday lives. And, and that's the, the setting here that we're going to read today in John chapter 2. Well, I encourage you to open your Bibles, and then if you are able... Uh, both in person and those who are watching online, I'd love for you just to stand with me as we read God's word uh, this morning. John 2, uh, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus, Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, What does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine And did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you came to earth. The word become flesh tabernacled among us. You moved into our neighborhood to show God's glory and also to give us your grace. So Jesus, I pray this morning as we just study John chapter 2, God, that your words, your message would come out, that we would just be moved with a new awe and appreciation for the story of Jesus and how it is continuing on today in our lives. I pray that you would just step into my body, speak through my mouth, God, that these would be your words and that everyone who's here today in person, who's watching, God, they would just receive the message that you have for them today. In your name we pray. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. Well, we just wrapped up a season of politics, and boy, was this a crazy election season. How many of you are glad that the campaign season is over? Say amen. Amen. Well, imagine you are a political candidate, or imagine perhaps you're an entrepreneur launching a new product, or maybe a VP of marketing uh, like Josh Hermes for Polaris, and you're going to launch a new product. Well, whether you're a political candidate or whether you're an entrepreneur launching a new business or uh, you know, a director of marketing, you are going to make sure that first press conference, that first press release is exactly the way that you want it to go. Because you want every detail to be carefully crafted to make sure that that message that you're wanting to send is what you're trying to communicate. Right? You tracking with me? You want this very clear picture of what you are all about. And here, at this little wedding at Cana in Galilee, Jesus launches his campaign as the savior of the world. And it's like, wait, what? Like, look at this. No one is sick and close to death's door. No one is demon-possessed. No one is starving in need of some food. No one is blame, lame or, or blind in need of some healing. And yet, this is Jesus' first miracle. Why would Jesus decide that the quintessential signifier of what he is all about would be basically to keep the party going? To bring in not just okay wine, but great wine to keep a party going. Why would he do that? See, it's stories like this that help me know there's no way 
the Bible was just made up. Because if you were carefully crafting the story of Jesus to say that, you know, this Jesus of Nazareth, he really is the God-man who is the Savior of the world, you wouldn't pick this to be the first occasion where Jesus manifests his glory and shows his grace. Basically, that's, you know, two teenagers who are newlyweds kind of help them have, you know, not have egg on their face and this kind of mistake of running out of wine. And so why in the world would this be the inaugural sign that Jesus had come to bring the kingdom of God? And to me, this is compelling evidence that this is an eyewitness account. Well, perhaps this story symbolizes something much deeper than on first glance. Perhaps this story, this miracle, is a symbol of what Jesus is all about. So today, I want to dive into this story about a wedding, and I want us to see three things. Number one, what did Jesus come to bring? If you're taking notes, you can write that down. What did Jesus come to bring? Number two, why did Jesus have to bring it? Why did Jesus have to bring it? And number three, how does Jesus bring it? How does Jesus bring it? Well, the first one, what does Jesus bring? What does Jesus bring? When the Jewish people during this time reflected on what heaven or the arrival of the Messiah would be like, they thought about banquets. And and the wedding feast was the foremost model that came to their mind. And this moment provides the setting for Jesus' first miracle, and it's full of spiritual significance. In the Jewish wedding feast, wine was essential, not so that Guests could drink to excess and get drunk, but because wine was a symbol of exhilaration and celebration. It was of such importance that actually a lawsuit could be brought against that bride and groom if they didn't have wine at their wedding. Like, that's what a big deal it is. Like, we're going to bring a lawsuit against you because you didn't provide wine at your wedding. So what does Jesus bring? Jesus is saying, I am the true master of the banquet. I am the Lord of the feast. I come to bring festival joy. Yes, there is going to be pain and suffering both for me and my followers, but that's just a means to an end. This is the end. I come to bring life and festival joy. That's why this is my first sign. And John's emphasis is on the quality of this wine and its timing. John is saying everything else that has come before this wine is inferior. John is saying that everything else in the old Hebrew scriptures is inferior to now what the Messiah is bringing in this messianic new banquet. Why does King David in the Old Testament scriptures write in Psalms 34, taste and see that the Lord is good? Didn't the Israelites, didn't they know that the Lord is good? Hadn't they seen him lead them through the Red Sea and out of slavery and bondage and and provide them through the manna in the wilderness and water from a rock and, and defeating their enemies? Why did David say, well, taste and see that the Lord is good? Because there's a big difference between just knowing something and experiencing it. And see, God doesn't want us just to know all about him. God wants us to drink deeply, to experience it, to taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, as a Minnesotan uh, Swedish Baptist pastor, it's a little weird for me to say that Jesus came to bring festival joy, the kind of, you know, uh, wine that's, that's flowing, that people are dancing and celebrating at a wedding without abandon. But that is what the Bible forces me to say, that this is what Jesus came to bring, that kind of life, that kind of joy. This is the purpose of Jesus. He invites us to taste and see that he is good, to to participate in his life, the fullness of life, the joy that only comes through Jesus. If you know me, I'm I'm a bit of a geek. Uh, I love Star Wars, Mandalorian. I love Lord of the Rings, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, all that kind of stuff. And probably Lord of the Rings is probably my favorite book series and uh, if you read the books, there's these little hobbits, and they're kind of unassuming, and, but, but they're used in these great big ways. And, and you see Frodo and his companion, Sam, they, they go to Mount Doom, and they destroy the ring of power, and they think all is lost, but finally the eagles come and rescue them, and they think they're dead, and they, they wake up, and the world has changed. And, and, and I want to just share a little bit of, of that 
This is when Samwise Gamgee, uh, the great uh, servant and friend of Frodo, he wakes up. And, and you remember the last time he saw Gandalf, Gandalf was falling in, in Moria, and he thought Gandalf was dead, but Gandalf is alive. Here's what Samwise says. He says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. <laughs> is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? A great shadow has departed, said Gandalf. And then he laughed, and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. And as he listened, the thought came to Sam that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment for days upon days without count. That is what Jesus is going to do. Jesus isn't just going to take us away to heaven when we die. The Bible tells us that Jesus is going to bring heaven to earth, that every tear will be wiped away, that everything sad will become untrue. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to bring true festival joy, wedding, celebration type of joy. As well as uh, literature like The Lord of the Rings, I, I like a lot of classic literature, sometimes Russian literature. There's a passage from the Brothers Karmazov by uh, Dostoevsky, and here's what one of the brothers says, and I think this, celebrate, this uh, illustrates the point very well. He says, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man that in the world's finale at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity, for all the blood that they've shed, that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. At the end of the story, those will be such joy. The suffering that we've experienced will seem like just a couple bad nights of sleep. The joy will be so overwhelming. Jesus says, I am the master of the feast. I've come to bring joy. That is why this is his first sign. That's what he came to bring. Well, why did he have to bring it? You look around today and our world is so broken. I've talked to many pastors and, and followers of Jesus who are a few decades down the road from me, and without fail, almost everyone says that this is more divided as a country, as a nation, as a big C church than they've ever seen before, even more than the 60s and social uh, uh, rights and all these different movements that right now, because of social media, that really we, we live in these echo chambers, we're so divided. And, and, and we see Christians attacking each other. And, and we look around at the world and you see so much suffering, so much death due to disease. I mean, a million people will die simply because they don't have access to tuberculosis medicine that we, that we have in the West. Like, we see trafficking going on around the world. We see such brokenness. And the Old Testament scripture says there's a reason for that, that we were created to be in this relationship with God and we first existed in this, what's called shalom, which is perfect harmony with both God and man and nature. But when we chose to rebel against God, we, we chose to believe that God was holding out on us, that we knew better than God. And so we kicked him off the throne and we put ourselves on the throne and said, you know what, I can take it from here, God. And because of that, the world has fractured and now uh, we, we live in a way that we're not in harmony with, with nature around us and we see destruction there and, and we're not in harmony with each other and we no longer are in harmony with God. And so in the Old Testament, they said there has to be a way that a, a flawed humanity cannot stand in the presence of a perfect, almighty creator who set the world in motion and designed it all skillfully. And so, so what is the answer? Well, the Old Testament says there are these rites of purification, of ways to, to be made right with God. And in this culture, they had what's called a shame-based culture where it was more of, of the group versus the individual and kind of your honor was at stake. And this young couple, 
running out of wine would have been facing some severe guilt and shame. But Jesus comes, and in this miracle, he rescues them from that. And by transforming this water into wine, the water that was in these purification jars, he's replacing the idea that we have to do these purification rituals to be made right right with God. He's saying the old way of doing religion, all these rites, these acts of purification, they're being replaced by the, the new wine of the messianic kingdom instituted by Jesus of Nazareth. And how did he come to do it? When I was reading this story, did anything maybe stand out to you as kind of weird? Let me read part of it again. It says, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Now, again, first of all, that word woman, I've gone back and forth with different translations because it seems kind of harsh. And so like, why is he calling that? Well, it, it, it's kind of harsh, kind of not. It's actually the same word he uses when he's on the cross. And he's looking at his mom with love, and he says, Woman, look at, your, look at John. That's it now, your son. John, look at my mom. That's now your mom. Take her into your home. But it is kind of just this term of a little bit of separation between him and Mary. But then he says, My hour has not yet come. Now, got to be honest. For years and years and years, I would read this story, and I thought Jesus was saying, My time to reveal myself and start my ministry hasn't yet come. But then he does it. So it's like, I don't really get it. Jesus talked him into like starting sooner than he wanted, but that doesn't make any sense at all. Well, when you read the rest of the Gospel of John, Jesus is always talking about my hour. He's talking about his primary purpose. He's always thinking about his death on the cross. That is his hour. So let's read that again. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? It's not time for me to die yet. So they're in the middle of a wedding. His mom says they ran out of wine. Jesus says, it's not time for me to die yet. Is that a very strange non sequitur to you? Like, what is going on here? Well, a couple of things. First, have you ever attended a wedding with a single person? Have you ever been a single person and attended a wedding? I think sometimes I've been there. I remember that as a single person. And you're attending a wedding and you're thinking about your own wedding day. Maybe someday what that's been like. And I think Jesus is thinking about his future wedding day as a 30-year-old single man. You might, whoa, Eric, are you saying you believe like Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code fiction and, and like he secretly married Mag- Mary Magdalene? No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But how does the story of humanity end in the Bible? Are we all floating in some clouds up in heaven playing our harps? My goodness, no. That, that sounds so awful. I don't know why cartoons get it so wrong. Like, yes, that picture of heaven where we're all in some disembodied state up in some clouds, like, that just sounds awful. No, the story ends in the book of Revelation with Jesus bringing heaven to earth, that this earth that we live in will be renewed. There'll be a new heaven, a new earth, and we all celebrate as the kingdom of God is in place with a giant wedding feast. And the wedding of Jesus, the groom, to his bride, the church. It's the fulfillment of all that Jesus came to do. Life, everlasting joy, true shalom. Again, we are in perfect harmony with creation around us. No more global warming. No more you know, uh, species going extinct. We're in perfect harmony with each other. No more war. No more suffering. No more gossip. No more strife. Perfect harmony with God. That, that we are, that the gates of the city are open and we're able to, to be in community, perfect community with God and each other and nature and everything we love about this world is perfectly restored. And what a beautiful picture that is. And that is what Jesus is looking ahead to that beautiful wedding day someday when, when the church, the bride of Christ, is wed to the Lamb, to Jesus, and we all celebrate. But as Jesus is standing there, in this wedding, and he, he's looking ahead to that day, to his wedding. He knows that's his ultimate purpose, to bring people out of suffering and pain and separation and into community with God. And he's like, that is why I'm here. But to get to his wedding and that celebration, he knows he has to go through the horrible death on the cross first. See, in order for his people to drink deeply of his Joy. First, he's going to have to drink deeply of the cup of punishment and death. And in this wedding, Jesus is thinking, I've come to bring joy, but I'm going to have to die to do it. 
to get to the wedding, I'm going to have to first go through the cross. Does that make a little more sense of why he responds that way to his mom? In this first miracle of Jesus, we see him reveal his glory, but also him extending great grace with the power to change a life. That's what it's really about. This is this bounding, joyous, leaping story of what Christ can do for you. His mom says they have no wine. Life without Christ is like life without wine. The Bible often uses wine as a symbol for joy. In fact, the rabbis of Jesus' day had a saying that without wine, there is no joy. We could very well translate Mary's words as they have no joy. On this special wedding day, the happiest of all occasions, their joy had run out. And like these newlyweds, the universal experience of humanity is that there always comes a time when the wine runs out, when the joy of life, the exhilaration runs out. Think of so many celebrities, musicians, actors at the top of their game, so talented, all these fans, and yet they choose to end their life because the wine, the joy, the life is gone. And that is why life can't be just about pursuing pleasure for yourself. It can't just be about amassing wealth or or friendships or fame. Because no matter who you are, what wines you have tasted, there comes a time when the exhilaration and excitements of life wear out. Often it's when we're at our best health, when, when our money is increasing, we have friends, we have an abundance to eat, a, place to, a, a warm place to sleep. But somehow all those things fail us and life loses its sparkle. It can happen in the teenage years. It can happen when we're in college. Oftentimes when we've been married five to seven years or maybe in middle age, but it catches everyone. And that's what makes this miracle so important. Each of these water pots of purification held 20 to 30 gallons. So we're talking about as much as 180 gallons of wine. Jesus turns for this couple. What an amazing wedding gift. 180 gallons of wine. This is a gift that would provide this new couple with money for quite a long time. And the provision of such a large amount of the choicest Wine symbolizes the inauguration of the long-awaited kingdom of God. That God has drawn near in the person and ministry of Jesus. And the fulfillment of the promise of abundant blessings is going to be realized. Jesus is saying, I come to bring life and joy and overwhelming beyond what, what you can expect, beyond what you can hope for. A little bit later, about three years, the night before Jesus goes to the cross, he's talking to his friends in John 15 He says this in verse 11, he says, These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus' desire is that his joy is in you and me, that we may be filled with the new wine of Jesus, full of the joy, the life of Jesus. That my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. So what does this mean for you and me? Well, as far as we really see in scriptures, Mary, the mother of Jesus, only really gave one instruction that was written down for us. And that was, do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And I think that's the message for us today. To do whatever Jesus tells you to do. Now, what's so interesting is that we don't know exactly when the miracle took place. Was it when the jars were filled? Was it when the servants drew from the jars they'd filled? Was it when they carried that sample to the master of the banquet? John seems to suggest that what they drew from the stone jars was only water. When they'd drawn the water and carried it to the master of the banquet. That means that most likely the miracle occurred on the way. As they carried what they had drawn to the master of the banquet. The obedience of the servants and their faith in Jesus played an important part in this miracle. See, that miracle you're waiting on might be happening on the way. But what step of obedience do you need to take? What is Jesus asking you to do in faith? Those servants had to fill 180 gallons of water into these purification big holders. And they're probably wondering, why are we doing this? And then they had to draw some water and bring it to the massive banquet. And they're like, this is just water. But then when he tastes it, it's wine. 
the choicest wine. I think so often Jesus asks us to do something, to take that step of faith, and we don't see it right away. Whether it's planting a new church, whether it's choosing to be foster parents, whether it's starting that new business venture, maybe it's just getting to know your neighbors to say, hey, you're going to text them, uh, you know, is, is there any way that I can, you know, bring you some groceries or do something for you? What is that step of faith that you feel like Jesus is kind of just nagging you to take that step? And you're not sure, and you're kind of waiting to be sure, but so often Jesus wants us to take that step of faith before we're sure. And a lot of times that miracle happens on the way. And through this first sign of turning the water into wine, Jesus revealed his glory. That he is the God-man, God clothed in flesh. He is able to transform and change the water to wine, dead lives to new lives, to heal and restore marriages, to heal and restore our bodies, our minds, our spirits. This sign also showed his grace, that he went over and above what he needed to do. He gave an abundance of not just okay wine, but the best wine to this newlywed young couple who was facing some shameful embarrassment. In the same way, I think the message of God's grace isn't just that we're kind of just, you know, our slate is wiped clean, but instead it's, it's much more beautiful than that. The Bible says there's this great exchange. That not only are we made new and wiped clean, but the resume, the righteousness, the Bible says, of Christ is credited to us. And I don't understand that. That God looks at us, he sees all the amazing things that his son has done, that gets credited to us. And we aren't just wiped clean, but we get the resume of Jesus. How amazing is that? That's what grace means. And through Jesus revealing his glory and his grace, John tells us that his disciples believed in him. Today, he's asking, do you believe in me? And we can't overlook the context as we wrap up today. It was a wedding. It was a wedding. The Bible ends with the story of the wedding. The bride is the church, and the groom is Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? You are invited to be united with him, and someday... At the end of the story, heaven comes to earth and there's a great wedding feast where his joy flows freely, where all the wrongs are undone. And every tear is wiped away and we are living in perfect shalom, perfect peace and harmony with nature, with God, with each other. I invite the worship band to come up and close us in one worship song. As we close, I just want you to just imagine what it would be like each day this week, to just actively drink deep, to taste and see the Lord is good, to say, Jesus, I, I want to drink deeply of your joy. I I'm praying, Jesus, like in John 15, that your joy may be in me, that your joy may be complete. And I know it can be so hard to experience joy in situations like this with COVID and, and the uncertainty and division and it doesn't mean we stick our heads in the sand. It doesn't mean we don't fight for justice and equality and, and friendship with each other. But it means we do that from a position of, of an identity, of, of, of being united with Christ, with his Holy Spirit inside of us. That's how we bring joy to the world. A couple real quick practical things. Uh, one of the things I've been embracing uh, this, this year is, is the practice of gratitude. This is something um, you can read up on if you want. There's podcasts, TED Talks, books about this, that just the act of gratitude from a neurological point of view can rewrite your brain. And so I want to encourage you, if, if you're wanting Jesus' joy to be in you, to practice gratitude. Uh, starting today, I'm going to take a 21-day fast from social media uh, just so that I can practice joy. And one of the things that's so important to me is I wake up and I need to read scripture. And then I just journal some of my thoughts. And then I, I write gratitude. And, and I just say, here are things I'm grateful for. You know, I'm grateful that 
So far, my family, we've been very healthy the last 12 months, healthier than we've ever been. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that I have enough to eat. I'm grateful that, you know, we're able to do these things. Uh, Hey, I'm grateful for the stimulus money. Uh, You know, I'm grateful for these different things. Because if we practice gratitude, it really rewrites our brain, especially first thing in the morning, not filling it with news, whether that's MSN or Fox or CNN, not filling it with social media. I'm not saying you have to fast social media the next 21 days, but maybe you want to take a break. But at least don't start your day that way. And then as you practice gratitude, that will really help you to experience more joy. Uh, Practice some stillness, some quiet. You know, maybe if you're married and the kids are around all the time, get into a habit of taking some turns. All right, you get out of the house now and take a walk, get in nature. Okay, now you can do that. Or, or you know, maybe there's a, another family that you're going to, you know, uh, you're, have your own little circle of quarantine with and you can swap date nights. So at least you can get out, uh, at least as a couple together, maybe, you know, go snowshoeing, go hike in the woods, whatever it might be. Get in nature. Just, just to... When we can be in the sunshine, when we're eating real foods that was really alive once upon a time, those are the things that we take care of ourselves and then we'll feel the joy of Jesus in us. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to close today with just singing one more song uh, in celebration of God. Jesus, I thank you that you came, that you tabernacled among us, you moved into our neighborhood. And that you chose as this first sign of uh, this first miracle uh, to bring joy and life at this wedding. That you revealed your glory, that you are able to transform and change. You showed great grace by providing an abundance of the best wine for this new married couple that just blessed them to start their married life well. And through this sign that your disciples believed. And so God, I just pray right now that we too would believe in you. God, I pray if there's if there, that thing that you've been nudging on our hearts, that step to take, God, that we would be faithful to obey you, to trust that sometimes that miracle happens on the way. And Jesus, right now, we just celebrate you. I just pray that we just have a, an attitude of gratitude, that your joy would be in us, that your joy would be complete so that we could just, from that position of joy as your sons and daughters, we could be your hands and feet. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, Would you stand with us and let's sing this last worship song together.